Good luck. When you get to England, tell them how we're getting on over here. Tell them we're having a tough time, that the Germans can't get us down. And tell them that more of us will be following you. And tell them that in spite of everything, we're managing to hear the BBC. To make the declaration. But can you doubt what our policy will be? Any man or state who fights against Nazism will have our aid. A bit melodramatic for the British crawling about in attics, but Germans and melodrama go together. There must be thousands of you over in Britain who spent holidays in our islands before the war. Do you remember them? The sandy beaches, the cheap drinks and cigarettes, and that crossing from Weymouth or Southampton? Well, there hasn't been much of a holiday atmosphere over here for the last five years. When the Germans arrived in 1940, our first reactions to them were probably the same as yours would have been. To give the devils their due, their discipline was good. But they soon started taking things away from us. First, it was our radios. And then they had a look round and picked out our best horses. They were short of transport, so they took our cars at their own price. Anything over two or three years old went on the scrap heap. The result was that we went back 30 years and trundled about in ancient horse-drawn buses. When our bicycle tires wore out, we rode about on the rims for a bit. And then we started making tires out of old garden hoses and odds and ends. But worst of all, they stole the truth and filled our newspapers with gerbils and haw-haw. The remedy was simple but dangerous. We ran our own with the help of the BBC. It's doubtful whether any formed body of enemy troops remains on Egyptian... One of our papers was called Guns, Guernsey Underground News Service. Mick Robbins, who was then a junior reporter, played a large part in the distribution of guns. The originator, Machon of the Guernsey Star, was eventually caught and sent to Germany where he died, poor chap. Fallow and Dukeman also went to prison.
one of the ways the news got around. When things began to get short, some of us took to growing our own tobacco. And when tea stopped coming in, we made it from bramble leaves. The most successful substitute for sugar was a sort of treacle which could be got out of beet. We rigged up our own presses for this and the result wasn't too bad. It was sweet anyway. And as for clothes, well, it was a case of mending your mending. As time went on, we rapidly found out for ourselves the full meaning of German occupied territory. They made a horrible mess of the islands with barbed wire, mines and fortifications. Most of the work was done by imported slave labor, Russians, Poles and Czechs. When they cut off our electric supply, we started to make crystal sets. Mr. Taylor, a butcher in St. Helier's, and his daughter Peggy are typical of islanders who turned out hundreds of them. So is Andre, a St. Helier's hairdresser. He made over 500 in the little room over his shop, while the Germans strutted about in the street below. We didn't need our crystal sets on June the 6th of last year to tell us that something big was on. We thought at first we were going to be liberated, but we soon realized that this was D-Day, the great day we'd all been waiting for. We'd only to stick it out a little longer and our turn would come. But for many of the slave workers, it would come too late. We were sorry for those slave workers. We'd seen the way they were treated. As the months went by, we followed the course of the war. Here General Montgomery has announced this evening that the British Second Army has liberated Cannes. I'm calling Europe with great news. Paris has been liberated by the French. Brussels has been liberated by troops in days of the war. Warsaw has been captured by the Russians. We were now in a state of siege. Food and fuel were getting shorter every day. The Germans cut our rations down to the bare minimum. And as for clothes and shoes, well, there just weren't any new ones to be had. In one week, a week we'll never forget, the Red Cross ship Vega put in at St. Peter Port and then at St. Helier's. She brought us everything we'd been without for years. There was a Canadian and a New Zealand Red Cross parcel for everyone. It was probably the Red Cross parcels and the way the war was going that made us start to listen almost openly to the news. Andre, the hairdresser, set an example and ran a sort of luxury listening service for his customers. But it didn't last for long. An informer gave his name to the Gestapo and he got six months in Jersey jail, where, incidentally, he still went on making crystal sets and listened to the news with the warders. We were very ashamed of our traitors, people who'd split on you for a handful of dirty marks. There weren't many of them, but we shan't forget them. They used to write anonymous letters to the Gestapo, telling them where they could find hidden radios. But the post office workers had a way of dealing with these letters, and a great many of them never reached the Gestapo. The food situation was now getting desperate, and the livestock was in a very bad way. Actually, of course, it was as broad as it was long because if they'd been fat, the Germans would have had them. There was absolutely nothing in the shops apart from the ration of one ounce of breakfast meal per head per day. There was the black market if you could afford it, but for ordinary decent people, it was always the same. No, I'm sorry, nothing. So we had to make the best of a bad job and struggle through on what vegetables we could get. Jack and Florrie Steele, they'll do to represent us, were forced to feed their two children day after day on carrots and potatoes.
like everyone else, they went down to the beach to collect carrageen moss, and that's a sort of seaweed. It had to be washed and dried and cooked, but it gave us some of the vitamins we needed to keep going. We did everything we possibly could for the children. They had fresh milk every day and a cup of soup at school. But we couldn't do anything about their clothes or their shoes. Then in March, the Vega came again. But this time, the Germans were as hungry as we were, and troops who'd been fairly well disciplined up to now went haywire. They stole all the Red Cross stuff they could lay their hands on. But the news was getting better and better. Well, over a quarter of an hour ago, the all German wireless in northwest Germany, Holland and Denmark that tomorrow will be celebrated as victory in Europe. Day. And then at last it came. The end. We forgot we were hungry. We forgot everything except that we were free. Then the food started coming in, masses of it. The army was in charge for 90 days, and their first job was to supervise the unloading. There were double rations for everyone. Most of your children know what an orange looks like, but our younger ones didn't. They had to be shown how to peel them. There was a free issue of cigarettes. The old boys would have preferred a pipe, but it was real tobacco, not a horrible mixture of herbs. The shops closed for a week, and the assistants went to a central depot where they sorted out the clothing that had come in. We could scarcely believe it at first, seeing the shops full of things. We went about in a sort of daze, hardly daring to touch anything in case we'd wake up and find it wasn't real. But there it all was, clothes, food, shoes, any amount of it, and plenty more to come when they'd sold out, which was pretty soon. Jack and Florrie Steele, and that means all of us, had their first normal British meal, a cut off the joint and two veg, the sort of meal you've been having once a week ever since 1939. There were second helpings if they wanted them, and they did, and so did we. There were copies of Pravda for the Russian slave workers who'd found shelter with our farmers. We got our radios back. Some of them were minus a valve or two, but we'll soon get them going again. Give us time to sort ourselves out and we won't let you down with our exports. starting to enjoy ourselves again now. There are family reunions to be celebrated, and over and above everything else, that wonderful feeling of being free. Free to do what we like, when we like. Meanwhile, the Germans have the thoroughly unpleasant job 
of removing the 200,000 mines they laid in the four islands. That goes for the barbed wire too. No one has suggested giving them gloves. Their last job over here is really very simple. They've got to clear up all the mess they've made so that we can return to a normal, civilized existence.